Hello everyone, welcome back to the wonderful world of cognitive psychology. Today we are going to be talking about long-term memory and what it means to actually have long-term memory. So when we think about long-term memory, the very first question that comes about with long-term memory is, what is long-term memory? Uh, long-term memory is assumed to be a place where we're going to be storing information for a very long period of time. And essentially here we're going to have information being lasting potentially forever. Now, when we think about this aspect of forever, uh, why is it that we would consider this aspect of potentially forever? Uh, we assume that it's forever because we actually don't have any evidence to suggest that information is potentially lost or pushed out of an individual. Now, for instance, you've probably in many instances seen a TV show or a cartoon, whenever it is that they show like a graphic of information coming in one ear and other information that they had getting pushed out so that way they make space for the new information. And in reality, we don't really know if that's the way that memory works. We assume it does not work in that way. We assume that when information is coming in and it's getting stored in long-term memory, it's getting stored. Now, how much information can we actually store? We actually do not know what the maximum capacity of memory we can actually store in terms of an individual's brain. So in terms of our hard drive, our personal hard drive, how much information can I store? I don't actually know that. So in reality, we don't function like this graphic here as a flash drive would function that, for instance, it has a specific capacity. And once you reach that capacity, you have to delete files or push files out so that when new files can get stored. So in reality, we don't think that this, uh, this graphic is actually very representative of how our memory works. But rather, once information gets pushed in, we assume that information is in and nothing comes out. Now here, when we say that nothing is coming out, I'm referencing to deleting information or what we would say forgetting information, but I don't necessarily mean bringing the information back out to actually be able to use it. That's not what I'm referencing here. I'm referencing out as deleting the information or forgetting it as a way that we would typically use it. Now, when we think about what we're putting in, what is it that we're putting in long-term memory? And in reality, we're pretty much putting everything in. What is everything? Well, we're putting information for facts, we're putting in information for actions, things that what we call episodic memory or what we also call implicit memory. We also have information for uh, knowing just general information, but we don't necessarily know where we know that general information. Uh, we sometimes, what we call that is semantic memory, and we're gonna talk about all these different types of, uh, of information that we're putting into our long-term memory store. So first, let's begin talking about episodic memory. Uh, what is episodic memory? Uh, episodic memory is essentially information associated with facts. So in other words, knowing specific ideas or knowing specific information with events. We typically assume well, whenever it is that we're dealing with facts that we're dealing with episodes in our life or a specific situation or context that we were in that is in reference to the information that we're retrieving now. So here, the reason that we call episodic memory episodic memory is because we assume that information is being treated as if it were an episode in our lives. So in other words, we can look at the information associated with uh, the specific situation or with that specific event and recall in great detail information about what we experienced. Let that be our emotions, let that be specific details associated with the event or specific locations. So when we think about this idea of dealing with facts, we can actually store information associated with dates and times and even with spatial relations of that information. So where exactly was I in relation to other objects in the room? Or where was I standing in a room? Or where was I in specific location of the city whenever this specific event happened? So with episodic memory, we are really dealing with specific details associated with an event. Normally here, what we will also talk about is the idea of what we call flashball memories, which are a type of episodic memory. Now, when we talk about flashball memories, we are actually talking about memory for circumstances where you first learned about a very surprising or even a very emotionally arousing event. Now here, for instance, one of the more recent events that you probably can recall that is in reference to a flashball memory is whenever it is that you first heard about 9-11. For many of you, 9-11 probably occurred when you were very, very young. For me, it occurred right around when I had started college. And I still remember exactly what happened, where I was, what time it was, and what I was doing exactly when I first heard about this incident. 
So for me, when I first heard about 9-11, it was about uh, almost 8 o'clock in the morning or so, Central Standard Time, on September 11th of 2001, and I was crossing uh, the U.S.-Mexico border, because I lived in Mexico at the time and I would study here in the U.S. So I was crossing the border in my car, and I still remember I was about two vehicles ahead of the customs inspector uh, right before I got to, to crossing the border. And I remember listening on the radio and having the disc jockeys talk about this event. But the way that they framed it was, oh, somebody crashed a propeller plane into one of the Twin Towers. Man, how dumb are they that they didn't see this huge building? I mean, like, come on, you're flying in New York, didn't see this huge skyscraper, and you crashed your plane? Like, what's wrong with them? So it was kind of like this kind of joking issue because they didn't really understand or have all the details associated with the event, understanding that it was a terrorist attack. So I still even remember hearing about the situation and saying, oh man, that is kind of silly. Like, man, like why would you ever crash your plane? And the way that they framed it also was, well, nobody really got hurt except that the person who was flying the plane, but everything is perfectly fine. And I still remember then going to uh, a talk. I had a, a presentation for one of my English classes that I needed to attend to. And I had turned off my cell phone, and when I got out of the presentations about an hour later, uh, I turned on my cell phone and I had about 10 missed calls and uh, messages, all from my brother yelling at me as to why I wasn't answering my phone and that I needed to cross the border and go back home into Mexico because they were going to close down the border and they weren't going to let people in or out of the country. So I still remember specifically standing outside of the auditorium, listening to the phone, still remember the type of phone that I had. It was a gray flip open phone, so this was back in the day listening to my brother's uh, voicemail and I still remember then running to uh, the student union uh, to go look at uh, the TV to see what was happening and I still remember exactly where I was standing watching the TV and watching the very vivid images of the towers being on fire. So for me, I still remember specific times, I still remember specific dates, specific locations in terms of that emotionally arousing event. Now here, does that event have to be traumatic in its nature? And the answer is no. It can be a very happy emotion. So for instance, the day that you got married or the day that you got engaged or the day that you had your, your first child. Uh, for me, for instance, when I had my first uh, child, I still remember very viv vividly uh, everything that I was doing. And with my second child, I still remember very vividly what I was wearing. So with my first child, I don't remember what I was wearing, but with my second child, I remember exactly what I was wearing, exactly where I was standing in the delivery room, everything about that situation. I'm very, very confident about what I recall. Now, very interestingly though, one of the things that we find is that even though, just as myself, many people believe that we can accurately recall all the little minor details about what was happening in that event, in reality, we make lots of errors about what we're remembering in that event. So in reality, for instance, I probably don't remember that I was actually wearing an orange shirt whenever it was that my second daughter was born. Uh, I still remember though, for my first daughter, I still remember this, that I was wearing a, a checkered shirt, a checkered, a checkered button shirt, because I wanted to look good for my daughter whenever it was that she was born. I mean, me and my delusion, right, that my daughter wasn't even going to notice that, you know, that she could even you know, remember what I was wearing. But for my second daughter, it was kind of like the last minute kind of surprise delivery. So I didn't even have time to change and I went in my exercise clothes. And the only reason I remember that it was actually that orange shirt was because while I was getting this lecture ready, I was looking at pictures of that event and I saw the orange shirt. And I was like, oh yeah, I was wearing that orange shirt. But in reality, I probably would have never remembered that I was wearing that orange shirt. So in reality, even though we all claim that we know very, very specific details of the event, we know the generalized ideas around the event and specific details that are very general in their nature. So knowing, for instance, where you were, that's correct. Knowing potentially what time it was, that's correct. Seeing the very first images or the emotions that you portrayed, those things are correct. But knowing all the nitty gritty details are probably not going to be accurate. And we tend to fill in that information. And that's okay, to be honest with you. Now, when we think about looking at episodic memory, there are a couple of different ways that we can actually measure episodic memory. The first way that we can actually do this is by using what we call parasociate learning. Now, with parasociate learning, essentially what we do is we give pairs of stimuli or, or pairs of words, and we ask individuals to make associations between the two. So, for instance, you give an association like 483, with the word wheel, or light with the word male in this particular instance. 
Now what we do is we give the individual a stimulus term as a cue. So for instance, they would be given 483 and they need to produce or identify that wheel should occur in terms of that pair. Okay. Now here, this is in reference to knowing specific facts because this is a very specific association. Because if you actually think about the pair 483 and wheel, you're thinking to yourself, there's no association there, and you're correct, but we're forcing you to, to make that association. So you have to learn and know the specific facts associated with the pair of 483 goes with wheel. So we give you 483, you have to come up with me, wheel, thus understanding or giving us the idea that you have that episodic information there, you have that fact. Now we can also use what's called serial or free recall. Uh, in many instances we do this, we've already done this in some of our previous examples in class uh, that I've given you guys uh, the list of words that all were in reference to something that we do whenever it is that we sleep. Um, and here, very interestingly, uh, what we do is we just give you guys the words and then we ask you to recall them and write them down. Here you can write them down in order or you can write them down in any order, it doesn't really have to, to be in a specific order, but here depending on how much information that you recall, that gives us an indication also of episodic memory because you're remembering specific details, you're remembering specific facts that we've given you. Now we can also use what's called a recognition test. Uh, in recognition tests we have what's called old versus new and we also call these old versus new tasks. Uh, and a recognition test is essentially hey, have I seen this information before or have I never seen this information before? If I've seen this information before or I think I've seen this information before, I'm going to say that I've known this information. So you're going to say, yes, I've seen that information before or I'm going to say, no, I've never seen it. This is new information. So thus again, leading to this idea of knowing specific facts in those specific cases. Now, how do we actually acquire facts? How do we acquire information, which is a big thing for us, right? Well, a lot of the aspects associated with acquiring information is going to depend on how much it is that you're trying to learn and how much it is that it takes between when you learn that information to when you actually put it into practice. Now, one of the big issues here that we actually have is working on that information. Now, we saw this with, for instance, Herman von Ebbinghaus's work, that he looked at this aspect of how many times do I have to go through a list before I can recall this information perfectly? And then the more information that he had to remember, the more times he had to go through the list to actually remember the information at 100%. So here, it matters quite a bit how much it is that we practice, right, or how much it is that we're trying to learn and how much it is that we're practicing on that information. And then also, how frequently are we studying or how frequently are we putting this information into practice? So in other words, how often am I practicing this information? Now here we do encounter what's called the power law of practice, and the power law of practice essentially predicts that the more times that you practice inf information, the less improvements that you're going to have. So in other words, it's going to be harder for you to actually have more significant improvements because as you practice more and more and more, you're really focusing in on the information that you've already acquired accurately. You're really working on that and adding new information starts becoming a little bit harder. So the improvement is actually going to decrease. So you're probably going to have, for instance, like in the case of Herman von Emminghaus, that he had to have 20, 30 trials of practice sessions so that, that way he could actually remember 12 or 15 uh, of his nonsensical, nonsensical sy uh, syllables that he was trying to acquire in those instances. So for him, it was harder to have those improvements because there was so much information that he had to practice on initially and then adding new information was going to be very, very difficult so there were very, very minor improvements in those specific issues or in those specific cases. Now we also do have what are called spacing effects and with spacing effects, the length of study time varies between the task or between what it is that you actually want to learn. Now the performance that you have associated with your recollection of that information is going to depend quite a bit on the lag between when you study to when you actually implement what you studied. So in other words, when you practice to when you put it into practice. So here, this is why whenever it is that you're going to study for an exam, it's not necessarily efficient to study six weeks ahead of the exam and then never study again for the test but rather studying progressively for six weeks up to the point of the exam and then having one or two really good study sessions prior to the exam is going to be a much more efficient way. Now also do think about going back to this issue of amount of information that you have to practice on 
because if you have too much information to practice on and you wait till the very last moment, because according to you, if I wait till the very last moment to study and then I go and take the exam, I'm gonna do better, that doesn't always work because sometimes you may be overloaded and you may then become cognitively fatigued. So ultimately here, what do we need to do? We can't wait too long to produce uh, information because if we wait too long, we may potentially produce forgetting, right? So if we wait too long, we may potentially not be able to retrieve the information accurately that we've learned because you're having a difficult time retrieving that information because now there are other things that are in the way that are potentially going to create interference for us in that specific instance. Now we also have to consider how, what kind of practice, you know, what kind of studying it is that we're actually doing. Now here we encounter the issue of deep versus shallow processing. For many of you, what you're currently doing as you're listening to this lecture and looking at the slides is you're doing what's called shallow processing. What a shallow processing means, you're listening to what I'm saying, you're reading the words on the screen, and you're saying to yourself, yeah, all right, that sounds good. But you're really not doing deep, elaborative processing, making those connections. We've already talked about this in previous lectures as well, that when we read information, we actually have to think about what that information means. What does it suggest? We need to make sure that we accurately are recalling the situation that we were put in and the connection between all the terminology and what was coming up on the screen and what it is that I'm saying. So that way you make that elaborate connection to make things make more intuitive sense. So here, the more work that we actually do, the deeper processing, if you want to think about it like that, the deeper the processing that we actually have, granted the more tired you're going to get, but the better the connection is going to be. Things are going to make a lot more sense. So what's better than just listening to my voice and, lo and looking at the lecture? Pause the lecture. Write down a couple of notes for yourself about what I just said in your own words so that, that way you're making that deeper connection. Don't just write down whatever's on the screen and just assume here that because you wrote it down, you're going to know exactly what that meant. Because we've all encountered the situation that we are then studying later on and you're like, I wrote that in my notes and I have no idea what that means. Now, one other additional way that we can learn uh, information or that we can acquire information, now granted, there's lots of ways, there are more ways that we can do this, but in terms of what it is that I'm talking about here, are what we call the generation effects. And essentially with the generation effect, don't necessarily think that there are differences between millennials and baby boomers in terms of generation effects, in terms of how we acquire information, but rather, what does it mean with the generation effect? we have to think about the way that we are generating the relationship. So how are we generating that deep processing? Now here when we think about, for instance, pairs of words, if we give you the example, for instance, rapid F versus rapid quick, if I give you rapid F and I allow you to come up with whatever the F word is, so here for instance, rapid fast, for you, that mean, that association is much more meaningful than me giving you rapid quick. Because if I give you rapid quick, I'm forcing what I think is supposed to be that association on you. But you may not necessarily feel that that's such a strong association because, for instance, for you, you may say, well, I really don't use quick very often. Or you think of quick the milk, right? Or the chocolate milk, the, the one that you put into the, to the milk and you mix it around. Now, my daughter likes quick, so when I think about quick, I always think about quick for my daughter, right? But I don't think about quick as in rapid. So here, if you allow me to make the association, if you say rapid, come up with the word, I'm probably going to say fast or speedy or something along those lines because I make that association. So in other words, if we allow the participant, so if you allow me to make the association, it's going to be much more meaningful. Why? Because for me, I'm making that meaningful connection. For me, there's a stronger association versus you imposing your specific strategy or your specific association. Because for me, your association may not necessarily work. We talked about this at the beginning of the semester, that everyone's memory organization is different. For some individuals, it works this way. For other individuals, it works this other way. For some individuals, they make these associations. For other individuals, they make those associations. So here, we have to be cognizant of that, and we cannot necessarily impose our own strategies to acquire information on everyone. People have to find their own. This is why one of the questions that I dislike the most that I get from students uh, many, many times is, how do I best study for this class to pass? That's a difficult question. Because for me, I would be doing X, Y, and Z. But for you, that may not work. For me, I would be making these associations. For you, that may not work. 
So everyone needs to come up with their own uh, ability to be able to make associations and acquire their own information through their own strategies. Now, let's move now to talking about what we call semantic memory. Semantic memory is a very important type of memory that we deal with in where we know information about how the world works. So in other words, we know structures of objects, we know the meaning of words, but we don't necessarily know all the details associated where that information is coming from. So in other words, I don't know where I learned this information about structure of objects, the meaning of words, but I know the meaning of the words. I know how objects are structured together. I know how to put a puzzle piece together, but I may, uh, I may not know where I learned how to put a puzzle together. Or for instance, if we come across the following uh, question here, is a butterfly a bird? Now here you're probably going to say to yourself, no. And if I ask you, well, why not? You're going to give me specific details as to why that's not true. You're going to tell me, well, it doesn't look like a bird. It doesn't have a beak. It doesn't have uh, potentially ears. It doesn't have this or that, whatever the case may be. It just doesn't fit the idea of what a bird is. And you're right. I would, I would agree with you, and I would say definitely a butterfly is not a bird. But where did you specifically learn that a butterfly was not a bird? And you're probably going to tell me, I don't know. So was there a day in school where they sat you down and they said, okay, now let's look at all the birds and what are not birds? No, right? But yet you know that a butterfly is not a bird. So you implicitly here know the information associated with a butterfly not being a bird, but you don't necessarily know where that information comes from. This is why we call that semantic knowledge, because you just know general information about how the world functions and about general information associated with things in our world. Now, we also have uh, this idea that when we think about memory, memories are really made up of all these different concepts. And we think about organizing this information of all these different concepts into generalized categories. So into overall larger categories or overall larger labels if you want to think about it like that. Now ultimately what we do for instance, we may have something like a different types of dogs uh, but we all consider them to be dogs, right? So you may have a poodle, you may have a chihuahua, you may have a St. Bernard dog and so on and so forth, but at the end of the day, you're gonna call them all dogs. Why? Because they all fall into that general category associated with the dog. Now here, if I specifically ask you, well, why is it that that is a dog and not something else? You're gonna say, well, because it fits the idea of what a dog is. Again, you have general knowledge of the world, but you don't know specifically where you learn that idea of a, uh, of a poodle being a dog and a chihuahua being a dog. You just know that information. Now, when we think about semantic memory, we really have to come across this idea of what we call semantic networks. We visited this idea in our previous, uh, in, in some of our previous uh, lectures, but here I'll re re uh, reiterate this information for us. Now, whenever it is that we're looking at this idea of semantic networks, one of the primary things that we have to consider is the following. What is the organization of memory? What is the organization of specific concepts that we're dealing with here? So for instance, we can come across what's called a hierarchical model, uh, which was proposed by Collins and Quaylen back in the 1960s, almost 1970s, where essentially they proposed the following. We can have these categories, then we can have classes, and then we can have subclasses. So here, for instance, if we look at the overall general category of what an animal would be, you can see that there's specific details associated with what an animal is. It has skin, it can move around, it can eat, and it breathes. But now let's look at the specific category, or the specific classes of animals. So now, for instance, we're gonna make the distinction between a bird and a fish. But you'll notice that both birth, birds and fishes, or birds and fish, I should say not fishes, birds and fish are all associated with animals. So in other words, they point to animals. But now let's look at the differences between a bird and a fish. A bird has wings, it can fly, and has feathers. A fish has fins, can swim, and has gills. Perfect. So here we now identify core differences between the two, okay? So here the class identifies the specific differences between the different objects but yet they still refer to the overall larger category in this particular case of being an animal. But now let's look at subclasses. So in other words, now we're getting to be more specific associated with the class. Now here, for instance, if we look at the bird, we have different types of birds, a canary versus an ostrich. Even though they are very different from each other, they both still point to being birds because they fit the idea of what a bird is. 
they both have wings, they both can fly, or to a certain degree, right? We won't say that an ostrich can really fly in this particular case, but it also has feathers. A canary can sing and is yellow. Ostrich has long legs, it's tall, but in this particular case it cannot fly. So even though it cannot fly, but one of the prerequisites to being a bird is that it can fly, well, it still matches more of the similarities between what a bird is than what a fish is. And that's why we put it in the subclass of a bird and not of a fish. But now if we look at subclasses of fish, we have a shark and we have salmon. Now here, a shark can bite and is dangerous. Salmon is pink, is edible, swims upstream to lay eggs. But a shark, for instance, is edible. Potentially, salmon can be dangerous if there's too many salmon or they can also bite. So here they have similarities between themselves as well, but they also do feel that fit into that overall general uh, class of what a fish is, that it has fins, it can swim, and it has gills in this particular case. So here we start seeing that now we can organize the way that we think differently. But yet at the end of the day, for instance, somebody comes at you and says, hey, is a canary an animal? You're gonna say yes. Is a shark an animal? Yes. Why? If they ask you, why are both now animals? It may be a little bit diff difficult for you to be able to say, well, well, they're both animals because of this reason, but yet you could potentially say that getting to the episodic aspect, knowing specific facts associated with what animals are, but yet in general, you're probably just gonna say because they both are. That's the common answer that we have whenever it is that we think about semantic memory, that we just say it is because it is, right? That's the general response that we give people because that's the most logical thing for us to say because you say, well, I don't know the specific details, but I just know that that's the way it is. So ultimately, the configuration captures the meaning of the above concepts. That's really what we're looking at here. So it's really capturing, so for instance, a canary is captured with what a bird is and it captures with what an animal is. So does an ostrich, so does a shark, but now it captures what a fish is and it captures still what an animal is in those specific instances. Now here, if you notice, there's no redundancy of concepts, so the superordinate categories carry some of the information that's actually relevant to the subclasses. So in other words, the bird information that we have here, has wings, can fly, has feathers, translates over to these, so we don't have to re-specify this information here, that we don't have to re-specify that a canary has wings, it can fly, and has feathers. You only specify other differences that exist between them. So in other words, it can sing and is yellow versus it has long legs, is tall, but it cannot fly. So here, it's important for us to now include that it cannot fly because it doesn't have this factor of that it can fly. So the superordinate category carries some of that information, but we sometimes do have to specify a additional information later on. Now, when we think about uh, other examples associated with semantic memory, let's look at two very uh, good examples of this. So whenever it is that I pose the question to you, the very first thing that you have to do is just create your answer. So again, don't think about... So again, don't think about the, the question. Just answer whatever it is that says on there. Don't read into it too much. Just answer whatever the question is. So the first answer that comes to mind. So here's the first question. How many animals did Moses take on the ark? Here, whatever your answer was. All right. And the answer should be none, because Moses didn't take any animals on the ark. Who took animals on the ark? And the answer should be Noah. So in reality, your answer should have been zero, but most of you probably said two, or two of each kind that you probably said, or pairs, because here, when you think about this question, you don't necessarily read all the details associated with it. You took out key pieces of information. You probably read animals, you read Moses, and you read Ark. But since two of the key pieces of information in this particular case are in reference to things that actually occurred in correct uh, context, so the animals and the ark, the only one that seemed out of the, order, order, out of the ordinary was Moses, but since it is a biblical name, you probably assume to yourself, hey, you know what? It activated the right information. It activated information associated with two of each kind, or the pairs. Why? Because animals and ark occurred in quick succession to each other, so they're related because animals did, were taken on the ark. Moses activates biblical name. Biblical also activates ark, and it also activates animals for you, thus allowing you to come to the conclusion that it really should have been two of each kind. Now, our second one. Everyone ready? Here's our second one. 
What was the famous line uttered by Alan Shepard when he first set foot on the moon? Everyone good? And most of you probably answered something to the degree of one small step uh, for man, one uh, giant leap for mankind. But in reality, you are absolutely wrong. And the reason for that is Alan Shepard was not, uh, did not actually say that, but actually that was Neil Armstrong. Actually, Shepard said the following, don't F up Shepard, whenever it was that he actually stepped foot on the moon. Uh, this actually became later known as Shepard's Prayer. Uh, so it's actually kind of funny that that's the thing that he said whenever it was that he said foot on the moon, but in reality, it was Neil Armstrong. But again, when you think about this, why is it that you probably said those famous lines by Neil Armstrong, but yet you actually thought about the wrong person? Because again, Alan Shepard, even though he is a, uh, an astronaut, but it's not the right astronaut that you're thinking about, it's so activates astronaut, famous activates astronaut in this particular case, first set foot on the moon, also activates this idea of the astronaut. You remember the very famous line associated with somebody setting foot on the moon. So you don't really evaluate and think to yourself, hey, it's really not Alan Shepard who said that. It was actually Neil Armstrong. Now, for some of you, you may have actually said, hey, you know what, Alan Shepard did not actually say any, uh, or I don't know what he said, but rather it was Neil Armstrong who said those specific words. But because why does that happen? Because you're actually giving it deeper processing. You're actually spending much more time thinking about what information is being given here. But if we allow ourselves to just go with the general information, we are going to quickly answer the wrong information because we're allowing ourselves to go with our general or our first assumption in these particular cases. So this brings us back to our important distinction here of semantic networks in our particular case. Now when we think about semantic networks, again, we also have to come across this idea of what we call spreading activation. We've talked about spreading activation many times before and we're revisiting it here again because it's a very important topic for us to discuss. And when we think about spreading activation, we are assuming here that we have activation of one concept or one node and that is going to spread and activate other concepts or other nodes that are close to it. So in other words, if we assume that this concept here, for instance, or this node is in reference to things that are famous lines, famous lines are going to activate all these other things that are around it, all right? And once it is that that famous line activates other famous lines, right? So whatever that famous line category is that we have, now it activates one small step for mankind, one uh, giant leap for, or sorry, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It may activate that one. It may also activate Martin Luther King's speech uh, or key phrases associated with that or whatever the case may be. It activates specific other famous lines. It's also going to activate other things that are similar to it that it may say, for instance, astronaut because that famous line is also tagged with astronaut. So here, think of it as being associated with tags, okay? So we're gonna have all these different tags uh, because they all are related to each other in that concept. Uh, think of it like a picture on Instagram or a picture on Facebook or whatever it is that we have, that you tag other people. The reason that we tag other people is so that that way, that one concept, that picture spreads to all those individuals. So it's now linked to all those individuals. So whenever it is that that individual then posts a picture, their own picture is probably going to be associated also with your picture, even though there is no direct relation, but yet it's gonna have some form of association because the common link is gonna be that person that's tagged in that picture. Same thing is happening here. We're activating one concept and it activates other concepts. That's why we got the answer wrong to the Moses question because our one node of animals activated ARC, so when we crossed ARC, it also was related to it, so it seemed to make sense that, well, if it's activating animal and it's also activating ARC, and here, now we have Moses that's also activated because it's a biblical name, and biblical names are associated with Noah and with Moses, so now there's lots of relation that's occurring, more than likely then, I'm going to say this particular response because that seems like the logical answer, even though you didn't really spend enough time reading the information and saying, I picked the wrong node, I picked the wrong concept, I need to find the right concept. So in reality, your answer should have been none because Ark should not be related to Moses. But it is related to Moses because it goes through biblical names such as Noah. And Noah is related to Moses because it's a biblical name in that particular case. Now we also encounter what's called the typicality effect. 
The typicality effect with semantic networks essentially is the following, where we may have uh, an individual say, uh, is a robin a bird? And you would say yes. And we say, is a chicken a bird? And we say yes. But here, if we ask you which one's more representative of a bird, you're probably going to say that a robin is more typical of a bird. So here, your response to a robin being a bird is going to be faster than a chicken being a bird. Why? Because whenever it is that we think of birds, what do we think about? We think about these small little cute birds that come out like in Snow White or something, and, and they fly around, and they're very cute and adorable, and we may even picture a robin as being that typical uh, idea or that typical concept associated with that node. But a chicken, you're not going to necessarily think about it in that particular sense, but yet it does fit all the parameters of being a bird. So if we go back to our hierarchical model and we think of, for instance, what a bird is, what is a bird? It has wings, it can fly, and so on and so forth. So here, even though a chicken may not necessarily fly, it still fits the parameters because it has feathers, uh, and so on and so forth. So here, ultimately, we respond much more quickly to a robin being a bird than a chicken being a bird, but yet they both are actually representative of the exact same category. So what does this mean in terms of a semantic network? It means that robin is much more closely associated in terms of its link to a bird than for us this is a very important issue because it gives us a general idea as to how memory is really organized for individuals. So in other words, it's more closely related that a bird is a robin than a chicken being a bird because there seems to be some more closer association between the two. So let's look here at how this would actually look uh, if we were to draw out a schematic for this relationship between a bird and uh, a robin and a bird and a chicken. So here, why is it that people answer a robin being a bird faster than to a chicken being a bird? Probably for the following reason. If we look at a bird as being our concept, and then we look at the association between a bird and a robin, for instance, there's going to be closer association between the two. So in other words, there may be a direct link between a robin and a bird versus a bird and a chicken. So in other words, let's say that a bird and a turkey are very closely associated, okay? And for instance, you may say to yourself, well, I think that a chicken is more closely associated with a bird than a turkey is for a bird, but here I'm just using this as an example. So let's say that for person X, for them, bird and robin are very closely associated, bird and turkey are very closely associated as well, but then turkey is associated with chicken. So here, we now have the association between a bird and a chicken. So why is it then that it takes an individual longer to respond that a chicken is also a bird in comparison to a robin being a bird? Because you'll notice here that the chicken now has to travel through turkey to get to the actual concept of a bird. So this subclass here of a chicken has to travel through other subclasses that are similar to it to then be able to activate this idea of what a bird is. So here, Getting to that higher ordinate or that higher subordinate class of a bird is going to be more difficult because it has a longer distance to travel between the two. Yet Robin has a direct link between what a bird is and a Robin is, so that they have this similarity between themselves. Now there's also this idea that we have with semantic networks that looks at the strength of the association between the two. So let's say that even though a bird and a robin are very closely associated, and for another individual, and here we're going to say again bird, and we're going to say robin, right here, there's going to be this direct association between the two, and let's say that for another person, for them, they also have bird and chicken very closely associated. So you may make the argument then, well, what if the person then has both robin and bird and chicken and bird directly related to each other? Why is it then that we would expect then that there would be these differences because a robin is more prototypical of what a bird is versus what a chicken would be prototypical of what a bird is? And one of the arguments that we find is that there's strength of association ultimately between the links of the nodes. So here, for instance, we may find that the link between a bird and a robin is stronger and it's darker here, right? So in other words, we use it a lot more frequently and it's more prototypical of it. So in other words, whenever it is that we think of a bird, we may picture a robin versus the picture of a chicken, but yeah, a chicken is still associated with the bird. So the more that you actually think of the association between a bird and a robin or a robin being a bird, it creates this darker association between them, this darker line between them. 
but yet chicken and bird, they are directly associated with each other, but yet this link may be very, very weak, or it may even be broken in some places. Now, whenever it is that I say broken, don't necessarily think that there is no association between them. It's just a broken line. So in other words, there is association between them. It's just weaker in its nature. So in other words, this could potentially also be an indicative uh, aspect as to why we had this typicality effect. Because even though chicken may be directly related to a bird in this particular example versus our other example that it had to travel through Turkey, here it's just a weaker example of what a bird would be, but yet a robin is a more prototypical idea of what a bird would be, thus why we have that association. Now, we also see that there are empirical studies that we use to look at this relationship between semantic primings. Now, what is it that we do? We normally look at the relationship between a prime and a target. So, for instance, we use the following prime, bread and the target is butter. And we ask you, are they related to each other? And in this particular case, you would say to yourself, yes, yes, they are related to each other. Bread and butter are related to each other. So you look in your semantic network, you find bread, and then you search around and you say, yes, butter is associated with it. And it takes me about 600 milliseconds to be able to answer that versus nurse and butter. So when you activate nurse, it should not activate butter. And here it takes a little bit longer because you now have to search through your semantic network trying to identify if butter is related to it. And you're like, no, they're not related to each other. Thus, I'm going to say no, they're an unrelated uh, prime and target. It took me 670 milliseconds to be able to answer that. Now here you'll notice the difference of 70 milliseconds is ultimately going to be the indicative aspect of how long it's taking you to search to be able to identify that bread and butter versus nurse and butter are or are not related to each other. But now for instance, this is an example here that we're using for an individual who assumes that nurse and butter are not related to each other. What happens in the case where you were in the hospital and your nurse was very, very attractive male or female nurse, right? You can decide whatever uh, your idea is in this particular uh, world. But here we look at this idea of, of a nurse who is very attractive who brought you some butter. Now, for instance, when you think of nurse, nurse and butter are going to be related for you. So your answer is probably not going to be no, but rather it's going to be like, yeah, they're related to each other. And it may even be faster. Why? Well, because there may be more emotional attachment associated between the idea of a nurse who was attractive and then bringing you butter versus a piece of bread and butter because that may not be emotionally arousing to you in some particular aspect, creating happy thoughts or being even physically arousing for you in that particular case. So here we see that this can potentially change. This idea of the semantic network changes. It's fluid. It's flexible. So don't think that just because Robin and Bird are associated to each other right now, and that's a strong association, that there's never going to be a stronger association between chicken and bird. Because potentially now, for instance, if you work on a chicken farm, for you, when somebody says it's a chicken and bird, you're going to be like, yeah, it is. Because for you, that's more prototypical because that's what you're involved in on a daily basis. That's your prototype versus a robin being a bird. But let's say, for instance, you work in an aviation sanctuary. So here you work with birds and you're in a sanctuary and you have lots of robins. For you, robin and bird are going to be more highly associated. So we do definitely see that there are big differences here in terms of the way that semantic uh, networks are organized. So now let's look a little bit at a change of pace because we've been talking about knowing information for facts, how do we actually acquire this information, how is information activated, but now let's look at memory for skills. The idea of what we call implicit memory or what we also call non-declarative memory. Essentially implicit memory or non-declarative memory is where we are unaware of our ability or our action that we've actually completed. So in other words, we don't necessarily know how we know how to do this action or how we did the action, but yet we just know how to do the action. So we use unconscious processes to complete this process or this action or this ability. So in other words, if you ask, for instance, a soccer player, how do you kick the ball so that, that way you can curve around? What the soccer player is going to be like, well, you, I don't know, you just do it. For them, that's their answer. Because for them, they don't know specifically how they do it. They don't know all the mechanics behind how to do that action. But yet they just know how to do the action and they do it. And they do it successfully. 
Now here, uh, Matlin, if you all r recall this name, she is the author of your textbook. Uh, she did some research back in the day uh, that actually looked at a very special case uh, of an individual who was walking around not knowing who she was, where she was, or anything like that. And ultimately, when the police found her, uh, the police gave her a phone and they asked her to dial a phone number. So while she was explaining to them that she didn't know who to call or what numbers it is that she even knew to call, while she's explaining to them and they've given her the phone, she actually dialed a phone number and she dialed directly to her mother. She was completely unaware that she dialed her mother or that she dialed that number, but she dialed a number that was related to somebody that she actually knew, yet she was unaware that she had dialed that specific number or what number she dialed, or even that it dialed her mother. So here, we are all guilty of doing these kinds of things because there are many times where we've done actions, but yet not necessarily knowing how we did that action. Again, going back to an example that I've given you guys in previous times about driving home and not knowing how you got home, then how did you get home? You just did the action, but you don't necessarily know how you did the action, but you did the action and you got home safely. Or at least we assume here that you got home safely, right? So ultimately, that's very, very important for us because it gives us this idea that we have this different category of what memory is. That it's not just memory for knowing information, but also we know how to do things or we do things, but without necessarily knowing all the processes behind how to do uh, those actions. Now, in terms of, of implicit memory, there's lots of different um, effects or illusions that we actually find associated with implicit memory. And here are some of just my favorites. Uh, one of the more favorite ones that I actually have is what we call the illusion of truth. And the illusion of truth is that when we actually give an individual a statement, for instance, something like the following, Kansas has a greater population, of, uh, population than Missouri, which is actually a false statement. If we tell an individual that this is true, Kansas has a greater population than Missouri, but yet they have no contradictory evidence associated with that, they have no factual information that says, no, Missouri actually has a greater population than Kansas, the second time that we actually expose them to this, the individual is much more likely to perceive this as being true than it being false. So even though we may even tell them at a later point in time, hey, you know what, that statement that we gave you that Kansas has a greater population than Missouri, it's actually a false statement. Even if we tell them that, the second time around, they're much more likely to even perceive that as being true, even though they've been told that it's false. Because here they may say, well, well I don't know how I know it's false, so I may not necessarily want to say that it's false, so I'm just going to go with it being true. So here, for them, they have this illusion of truth because for them, they just assume that it's true, but yet in reality, um, uh, it's actually a false statement. We also have what's called the false fame effect, and with the false fame effect, we actually give people a list of famous names, such as Brad Pitt, Burt Reynolds, Andrew Stairs, Melanie Kane, and here, we give individuals a list of people who are famous and non-famous as well. Now, out of this list, if you had to pick people who were famous versus non-famous, you would easily identify Brad Pitt as being famous, Burt Reynolds being famous, Andrew Stairs, you may say, well, I don't know, but that sounds like a famous name, and Melanie Kane, who are those people? And if you're wondering who Andrew Stairs is, Andrew Stairs is the guy on the left of Brad Pitt in this picture here. Uh, Melanie Kane is just a random name that I came up with. Uh, but Andrew Stairs here, for instance, is not actually a famous person, but I Googled him, and this is what actually came up. So if Andrew, if you're actually watching this, I'm sorry for using your picture or thank you for letting us use your picture that was on Google. Now what we find here is that the very first time that we actually give people this list of names, people are quite accurate in terms of identifying who's famous and who's not famous. People easily can identify Brad Pitt as, not, as being famous, Burt Reynolds as being famous, Andrew Stairs, uh, it seems kind of like a nobody, Melanie Kane, also I've never heard of that name, probably not famous. But what do we find the second time around? The second time around, we start finding that people start now rating everyone as being famous. And why? Because the very first time that we ever presented them, they all occurred with famous people. So in other words, Brad Pitt, Burt Reynolds, Andrew Stairs, and Melanie Kane now all have that semantic association. So in other words, that note of Brad Pitt is now associated with Burt Reynolds, who's also famous, and both of those are going to be associated now with Andrew Stairs. So both Burt Reynolds and Brad Pitt are famous, so then we would assume then that Andrew Stairs must be famous. Melanie Kane also is associated with these individuals, so thus they, she must also be famous in this particular case. So the second time around, we actually identify them as being much more famous than they actually are, 
because they have that semantic association between them, even though the first time around you were able to identify who was famous and who was not famous in that particular case. Now we also have the frequency of exposure effect, and with the frequency of exposure effect, which is also a very fun one, people perceive frequent exposure of stimuli more positively than non-frequent stimuli. We also call this the, this the mere exposure effect, which is a generally common used term in uh, social psychology. And with the mere exposure effect or the frequency of exposure effect, the more times that you're actually exposed to a stimulus, the more likely it is that you start growing uh, some type of positivity towards that stimulus, even though you initially found it to be negative in its nature. This happens a lot with music. Uh, generally, the very first time that we hear a song, you may say to yourself, you know what, that song is not very appealing to me. I really do not like it. Um, and, you know, it's just kind of annoying. But then the second time, all right, you know, I can tolerate it. Third time around, you may be like, you know, moving your foot to the beat. Third time, uh, fourth time around, you may be singing the lyrics. Fifth time around, you're like, this is on my iPod and it's my ringer all the time. Uh, this happens very, very frequently with music. And that's the whole idea of playing music on the radio. So if you've ever thought to yourself, why do they keep playing that same song over and over and over again? It's because they know that the more times that they play the song, the more likely it is that people will like the song or they'll grow positivity towards it, thus leading to higher sales. Uh, so for instance, there's a, a current Justin Bieber song that's out there w w that he has with Skrillex and it has really, really annoying sounds and the very first time I heard it like I literally had to just turn off the radio and I was like I'm done I'm so sorry like I, like that song made me very very upset because it had very very annoying sounds second time I heard it I was like uh, all right I'm just gonna turn it down a little bit third time I heard it I was like all right I'll leave it you know I'll listen to Bieber for a little bit fourth time around I was like hey what's up man I'm kind of enjoying the song but then I keep thinking about it and I'm like all that's happening is that the more times I listen to it I'm start growing this positive attitude towards it so I have to keep reminding myself I actually don't like this melody I don't like these sounds so I'm going to turn it off so now I've had to go back and tell myself to do that so thus turning off the radio because growing back a negative attitude towards that stimulus in that particular instance so sorry Bieber I don't like that song that you have uh, the next issue here that I want to talk about very quickly is the issue of autobiographical memory. Uh, autobiographical memory is, is a very interesting aspect associated with memory and that fits into the idea of, of episodic memory because it has this idea about knowing information about yourself. So knowing about events or issues that are directly related to you. So flashbulb memories fall underneath this category of autobiographical memories because we have this emotional arousal that created as almost as an episode of our own life event that we remember very, very, uh, very vividly. Uh, we also have what are called schemas that play a major role in terms of how we actually act in certain situations that revolve around ideas about ourselves. Uh, and schemas, for instance, uh, we have these general ideas of what knowledge or expectations should be for certain situations. These are based on our previous experiences. So based on past events that you've actually gone through that you remember, you now have expectations for what it should be in this new situation, this new context. So for instance, if you've ever had lunch uh, at Chili's versus having lunch at McDonald's, you have very different expectations as to what should happen when you enter that location. So when you enter, for instance, Chili's, you expect that someone's going to greet you at the front. You're going to go and talk to the hostess. The hostess is then going to ask you, um, you know, to take a seat at the uh, at your table, or they're going to take you to your seat at your table, or they're going to ask you to wait, depending if there's already a line of people. And then once it is that you get to your table, you're going to order your you're going to order your drinks first. Then you're going to order your food, but you also have to wait for the waiter to come and take those specific orders. And then you go through the entire process of what should happen at the meal. Now, let's say that you've never had the experience of having gone to a McDonald's, and the only experience that you've ever had is going to Chili's or going to restaurants like Chili's that had that same setup. So for instance, going to Texas Roadhouse, Johnny Carino's, and so on and so forth, that all have a very similar setup uh, to that idea of going up to a hostess, getting seated, or waiting, or whatever the case may be. Now, going to McDonald's, if you've never had that experience, is very, very different, right? When you go and walk into McDonald's, you cannot expect to meet a hostess and the hostess to be like, hi, you know, can I take down your name? Let me seat you at your booth and the waiter will be with you in just a minute here. But rather, you go up to the register and you order your food and then you pay and you go along your way and wait for your food to arrive. So very, very different expectations that should be in that specific situation. But for a person who's never gone to a McDonald's or a McDonald's type of restaurant and has only had experiences of a Chili's or Chili's type restaurant are going to have 
different expectations when they go into McDonald's because they're going to base themselves off of their previous experiences. So the same thing happens here whenever you've been in a relationship with somebody. If you've been in a relationship with somebody and you had a great you know, relationship with that person, but then it ended, you know, unfortunately, whatever the case may be, the next time you go out with somebody, you're going to have very similar expectations in that situation because you're going to say, well, based on my previous experience and you, everyone tends to do this, right? Oh, well, when I was with my other boyfriend or when I was with my other girlfriend, we used to do these kinds of things. Well, you can't have that same expectation with that new person, but you're basing yourself off of that because that's typically what you would tend to do because you're basing yourself off of your previous experiences. So schemas are doing that for us, that they're providing us with that idea. And under schemas, we actually call these scripts. So it's actually a script that you're following uh, to be able to do these kinds of actions or these general expectations. Uh, so here with autobiographical memory, uh, very important for us because it really gives us ideas about who it is that we are. When looking at long-term memory, what are some of the basic characteristics that we find associated with this aspect of long-term memory? Well, with long-term memory, we essentially explore uh, four primary characteristics associated with memory. Uh, number one, we're going to look at the capacity associated with uh, LTM. In terms of its capacity, uh, at this point, we really don't know any obvious limits. Uh, so again, we don't assume that there's this whole idea of new facts deleting old facts, but rather new facts do not delete old facts, and thus everything is really being stored in terms of LTM. Uh, in terms of how long information is going to be in LTM, the duration, again, seems to be infinite. Uh, Barrick and his colleagues uh, have done uh, numerous amounts of research in terms of uh, trying to identify how long it is that individuals keep information in LTM, and it seems that a lot of that information seems to be able to be maintained for long periods of time or for infinite periods of time, such as the graph on your right that demonstrates that kind of effect that we do really find that there's lots of evidence to suggest that there is retention of information across years and years and years of having acquired uh, information or having acquired knowledge. And then in terms of forgetting, again, this idea of forgetting isn't really a true term, but rather we should really say that it's a failure to retrieve information rather than for us to be forgetting specific types of information. But that is another characteristic that we do have to look at. And last, how do we actually code or how do we give specific tags to the information that's being given in terms of LTM? So is it going to be semantic information in terms of general knowledge of how the world works? Is it going to be visual information, specific sound information that's being given, spatial information in terms of location, or even kinesthetic information in terms of movements that you generally tend to make while you're completing an action? So for instance, what kind of movements do you do whenever it is that you ride a bicycle or when you kick a soccer ball or hit a baseball or throw a ball? Um, so all those types of things are going to have to be aspects that we code into the memories uh, that we're actually forming uh, in, terms of our, uh, in terms of our storage unit. Now, even though we do have information that's being stored, we do find that there's lots of, of issues that may actually happen in terms of retrieving information, because that's a huge part about this aspect of storing information, because now we have to get this information out. And we do find that there are some neurological issues that may arise that may potentially hinder our ability to retrieve information. Now, some of this aspect refers to the issues of amnesia about having a failure to be able to retrieve information or having a failure to be even able to encode information into LTM. So in other words, there are some individuals that have difficulty getting information into LTM into saving the file or saving uh, that fact into uh, their hard drive, right? But then also we have individuals that have difficulty retrieving the information as well. And we see that the hippocampus seems to be a major player in terms of our uh, understanding of how memories really work. Now, initially, we believe that the hippocampus was actually this area where we would store um, all our memories because we had um, lots of... Near, uh, uh, lots of uh, of medical cases of individuals having damage to the hippocampus that ultimately indicated or suggested that the hippocampus might be a very important region about where we stored memories, but in reality, we've now seen that that's not necessarily the case, but rather it does seem that the hippocampus or the hippocampi, because we do have in the right and the left hemisphere, if they are not working properly, 
people can potentially experience in, uh, different types of amnesia. Let that be uh, retrograde amnesia or even anterograde amnesia. And we'll talk about the differences between those two in just a couple of minutes here. Now, just to kind of look at this idea of where the hippocampus is, uh, we can see that the hippocampus uh, is right at the base of, of essentially where the corpus callosum will be. So if you actually, you know, so here we're, we're looking at um, like uh, our brain actually just kind of half of uh, our brain area in this particular case, a cross section of our brain. And in this particular case, you'll notice uh, that we do have uh, the hippocampus is being identified here. So if you were to sever the corpus callosum, if you go all the way down, um, between that band of fibers that connects the two hemispheres, uh, at the base you would be able to see that we have the corp uh, that we have the hippocampus there uh, on both sides of uh, our brain. So one very famous case uh, that we have identified in the psychological literature uh, was the case of H. M. Uh, by the individual by the name of Henry Mullisane. And the reason that now we are able to give H.M.'s name is because uh, Henry unfortunately passed away uh, quite recently. He passed away, if I'm not mistaken, uh, somewhere around 2006 or 2007 um, that he uh, passed away. And uh, before, we used to just have him by his initials, H.M., to be able to, to uh, maintain some of the anonymity associated with who this individual was. Uh, now with H.M., and, and here I'll refer to him as H.M. because that's the way I always grew up knowing him uh, in terms of his initials because that's the way he was always taught and, and it wasn't until recently that, that we actually know his name. But with the case of H.M., uh, when he was 27 years old, he actually underwent surgery to remove a portion of the temporal lobe that contained the areas of where he used to suffer from very severe epileptic seizures. Um, uh, H.M. was uh, known um, in, in his 20s to have these very, very severe seizures, and back in the day, um, one of the methods to be able to solve for the issue of uh, dealing with epileptic seizures was to essentially uh, remove portions uh, of his brain that may potentially uh, be creating um, those epileptic seizures. And in this particular case, uh, one of those portions was in the temporal lobe. Now, when the sur surgery actually went through, um, some of the hippocampal structures were also removed uh, as a safety precaution for HM, but yet the, our understanding of the importance associated with um, the hippocampus really wasn't well known at that time. The surgery was very successful in significantly reducing HM's epileptic seizures uh, and their intensity as well, and also in their frequency, but he became profoundly amnesic. Uh, until the end of his life, HM could not remember the events that occurred after his surgery or even people that he had met. Um, it was also known that uh, he actually suffered from a little bit of amnesia of events that occurred prior uh, to the surgery. It was even like a couple of months that he couldn't remember. Uh, but then it was said that he was able to remember up to very, very close in time um, in, in terms of the surgery, that some of those memories were able to come back of prior to the surgery. But then after the surgery, uh, nothing really uh, was uh, being given in terms of evidence to suggest that HM could actually remember uh, explicit information associated with things that occurred after the surgery. So in other words, he couldn't really remember episodic memories. He, he had a failure to be able to identify specific facts or specific knowledge that he had actually acquired. Now, one of the interesting things about HM in his particular case was that HM actually demonstrated very interestingly that he was still able to acquire implicit memory. So in other words, he was able to have procedural memory intact that he would actually know how to do specific tasks. So the kinesthetic aspects, for instance, the movements to be able to do specific tasks, he would still be able to do, yet he never knew that he had learned how to acquire that information. Now, one of the tasks that he had was this uh, mere tracing task uh, where people who have amnesia, like HM, are able to demonstrate that they have implicit memory intact by being able to trace um, the star in the mirror. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, well how does this particular task uh, actually reflect their knowledge of implicit memory. Well, number one, if you've ever tried to do this type of task, it's a very, very difficult task because you cannot be looking at the star directly. You have to look at the reflection of the star in the mirror and be able to do the tracing. It is a very, very difficult task, and when you initially do it, you take very long and you make many, many errors. 
one of the interesting things that we found with HM and patients like HM as well who do the mere tracing task is that as time goes by and they continue to do the tracing task over and over and over again, days, weeks, months, years, they actually begin to become more efficient at actually doing the task, even though they never remember when it is that they've ever done that task. And they'll report that they've never actually done the task or they've encountered that task in the past. They'll say, no, I don't even know anything related to this particular task. Uh, it seems like a very, very difficult task, but yet once we put them to do it, after they've done it many, many times in previous sessions, they seem to be much more efficient doing it faster and doing less errors, thus demonstrating that they have these aspects of implicit memories, these non-declarative memories, or what we would say procedural memories, they have knowledge for how to do things intact. So there is information going in into long-term memory in these particular cases with these individuals, but they don't seem to have uh, the knowledge of where they learn specific things. So in other words, he failed to be able to recall the episodic aspect associated with this memory. So saying, yes, I've encountered this task before, or yes, I remember when it is that I learned how to do this before, but he knew how to do it. Even though he claimed he didn't know how to do it, once he began it, he was very, very efficient in doing it. Now, whenever it is that we encounter individuals who have uh, amnesia, amnesia can come in different in different forms. Um, we have amnesia that can be backwards in time, and then we can have amnesia that can be forwards in time. Now, for amnesia that, that occurs backwards in time, we call this retrograde amnesia, and this is loss of memory for information learned before the amnesia-inducing inducing event, typically some type of brain injury. So in other words, in HM's case, for instance, he did not suffer from retrograde amnesia because all the information prior to his surgery he had intact. He knew all the information prior to his surgery. But there are some individuals who suffer from having um, this inability to recall information prior to that amnesia-inducing event. So again, with retrograde amnesia before, right, or in the past, the retro aspect, they fail to remember that information from the, uh, from the past. Now, the other option is going to be anterograde amnesia. And sorry, that should be a little bit lower here to be in correspondence to that uh, arrow at the bottom. And here with anterograde amnesia, they have loss of information for things after the amnesia-inducing event. So in other words, like the case of HM, where HM could not form any new memories associated with specific events, but yet in HM's case, for instance, he still had implicit memory intact, but he failed to have episodic memory. So for these types of individuals with anterograde amnesia, uh, they fail to be able to create new explicit memories. But yet individuals who have retrograde amnesia fail to be able to recall those explicit memories. So they're still able to do the tasks that they've done in the past, but they, yet they fail to be able to, to retrieve that information associated with, um, uh, with the facts that they've actually learned in the past. So just to kind of elaborate a little bit more on this idea of the mere tracing task, uh, remember that, that one of the things that we find here is that with implicit memories for these individuals, um, we still had implicit memories still functioning accurately. So for them, even though they demonstrated aspects of anterograde amnesia, not being able to recall specific information about events that occurred after uh, the amnesia-inducing uh, amnesia event, yet they're still demonstrating that they're able to be very efficient uh, at performing the task later on. So here, uh, this graph here demonstrates HM's results uh, and other control patients without amnesia, uh, how they actually perform in these specific uh, cases. And in both cases, both types of participants, HM and also the control patients, the very first time they ever encounter the task on the very first day, it's a very, very difficult task. They make many errors. They make a roughly about 30 errors. But after they continue to do the task over and over and over again, you'll notice that the amount of errors begins to decrease as the number of attempts each day continues to increase. Now, if you look at the second day, they do less errors on the first attempt of day two in comparison to the first attempt of day one. And then if you look at day three, the number of errors at the first attempt is much lower than the number of errors that they created at either day one or day two for the first attempt. Again, thus demonstrating that they are learning how to actually do this information. And again, remember with the aspect of learning, we're talking about creating knowledge and memories. So here they're learning, they're creating memories on how to do the task, but yet in this particular case with HM, he does not recall how to actually, uh, or when it is that he actually learned or that he's ever done this particular task in the past. 
Now, just to look at some ideas associated uh, with uh, this aspect of long-term memory and how we store information um, in LTM, uh, we look at the aspect of emotionality. Uh, there's a very important principle that we follow in memory research. It's called the Pollyanna Principle. And the Pollyanna Principle essentially assumes the following or predicts the following that information that's associated with positive emotions is generally remembered more easily than information associated with negative emotions. So positive memories are retaining their emotional strength more than negative memories. And why would this potentially happen? I mean, if you look at it from a Freudian point of view, uh, a Freudian point of view would say that negative emotions, uh, we would want to try to suppress or repress uh, some of the, uh, the memories that are occurring with negative emotions. So thus, we're going to have less likelihood of trying to recall that information later on so that's why we might have lower recall abilities but yet if something is neutral that has no emotional valence let that be positive or negative it may just you know occur um, uh, randomly in terms of being able to be recalled but yet if it's positive in its nature we're just going to have a higher recall rate because it creates a better sense of emotions for us in terms of being positive for us in that potential aspect now there are additional explanations that we can follow associated with this Pollyanna principle. And neuro, uh, neuro psychologically speaking, uh, there's a very good explanation as to why uh, positive events versus negative events uh, are remembered more. Now, one of the reasons that this may happen is because there is a neurotransmitter that is released whenever it is that we encounter highly stressful or negative situations. And that neurotransmitter that's uh, released is what's called glucocorticoids. And glucocorticoids, essentially what they do is they latch on to the hippocampus. So again, here we find that the hippocampus is very, very important for this aspect of memories. Now here with the aspect of emotions being uh, tied into this. So we know from the case of HM that the hippocampus is very important, especially because it seems to be kind of this bridge area between uh, when it is that an individual is learning something to storing it into long-term memory from short to long-term memory potentially uh, in terms of episodic memories, knowing specific details of events, right, or knowing specific facts. And what the glucocorticoids do whenever it is that they latch onto the hippocampus, they actually decrease the activity of the hippocampus whenever it is that they, that they become released. So whenever glucocorticoids are released in our body, uh, they go towards the hippocampus and they decrease the activity of the hippocampus. So if we're decreasing the activity of the hippocampus, mimicking very similarly to what happened to HM, that essentially HM has parts of his hippocampus removed, it's going to be very, very difficult for that bridge to exist. So essentially a barrier would come down that would say no information is going to get through. So here, almost like a safety for us, psychologically speaking, that is trying to keep us from psychological distress. So glucocorticoids actually may be helpful for us under stressful situations because very stressful or traumatic events that are negative in their nature uh, may hurt us in the future, right? They may create more negative emotions for us every time we think about them, uh, or they may be very problematic for us psychologically speaking, so thus glucocorticoids may then reduce the activity of the hippocampus, thus allowing us to have decreased uh, activity to be able to transmit information into long-term memory, specifically about details of those specific events. So thus why negative emotions would necessarily not be recalled more or facts that are associated with negative emotions would be recalled less because of a decrease in the glucocorticoid realm, uh, rather than just saying that it's depression or repression in those particular instances. So again, here, a, a, a neurological explanation as to why that might potentially happen. Now, so here, if you all first looked at uh, this image of the individual with the gun, you notice something very important happened. Your eyes went directly to the weapon itself. Now that I've allowed you uh, to be able to think a little bit about this image and as the image stays up and you notice that it's not going to be hurtful to you, you've probably looked a little bit more at the details surrounding this particular image. Now that's a very, very common issue that occurs and we're going to talk about why that happens because what we find is that lots of different things can actually affect the way that we actually interpret uh, our memories. And a lot of it is going to be based on the emotional aspect created by the memories themselves or by the events. Now, one important thing that we find is that if different emotional events happen to you personally versus in public situations, there's going to be very, very different vividness associated with those memories. Now, for instance, if you get embarrassed in a public situation, 
you may remember some details about that situation versus something happening to you personally that's very, very emotionally arousing. So in other words, the day that you may have gone engaged, the day that you got married, uh, the day that you may have had your first child or whatever the case may be, uh, ultimately these very personal emotional events are going to be interpreted very differently and have very different vividnesses, vividnesses associated with those memories that we're creating. So here we always have to consider that. What, where is this information happening or where is this event happening? Is it in a public situation versus a private situation or a personal uh, situation or is it a public emotional event that may have happened to a lot of people together and I was just a part of it? Or is it something that's very, very personal to me is going to drive a lot of the accuracy associated with that emotion? Now, one of the things that we do find, which is very similar to the finding that we had with flashball memories, is that our confidence is not correlated with our accuracy. So in other words, there does not seem to be a relationship between the confidence that I have associated with my memory and the accuracy of my memory. So even though people are like, I'm 100% positive that this is the person that committed the crime, many, many times we find that those are inaccurate representations. Uh, later on in the semester, we're going to have a whole class where I'm going to talk about eyewitness testimony and psychology and the legal system associated with cognitive uh, aspects. And it's going to be very important for us to keep this in mind that even though people report that they're 100% confident that that's the way things happened, it did not happen in those ways. It happens with our significant others all the time as well, right? That we say, oh, you know, I am 100% sure I told you to go buy bread, but that person may have never told you to go buy bread because you're sure that they never said that. So someone has to be wrong, right? Someone's 100% sure that they told you. Someone's 100% sure that they didn't tell you. So here something is happening there and, and, and there has to be a give and take in those aspects. Now we also find a very interesting hypothesis called the Easterbrook hypothesis and what the Easterbrook hypothesis uh, essentially predicts is that we have this narrowing of our attention occurring. So in other words, very similar to the bottlenecking effect that we've talked about, the Easter book hypothesis is essentially the idea of the bottleneck, that we essentially focus in on the center of the event, which is what's going to be remembered more than other aspects associated with the event. So in other words, we're going to have kind of this tunnel vision that's going to occur to specific items or a flash, uh, a flashlight or a spotlight is going to be shown upon a specific aspect where our attention is going to be drawn and that's where we're going to be looking and that's going to be the information that we're going to recall the best. Why? Because we tend to ignore the things that are surrounding that information and we're also creating this funding, funneling effect that we're not allowing everything to get through, but yet only specific information is really getting through. So it's more than likely that what we're going to end up doing is we're going to end up reconstructing events in terms of filling in the gaps because we assume that other things must have happened aside from just where it was that I was focusing and we're going to fill it in with the prototypical information that should potentially have happened in that situation. Now this refers back to this idea of schemas that we talked about a little bit prior. That we have this idea of what should potentially be happening. So if, for instance somebody pulls out a weapon and you look straight at that weapon, there are things that are occurring around that weapon. So things that are occurring behind that person, that person themselves, their face, were they wearing a do they have a mustache, what color eyes do they have, what color skin, shirt, etc, etc, etc. All these different things and if you don't have that information but you're required to provide that information or you're being asked to give that information, here you're much more than likely going to be uh, willing to reconstruct that event based on what it is that you assume should potentially happen based on previous experiences. And those previous experiences may not necessarily be accurate. They may be based on something like a TV show or your idea of a crime novel or whatever the case may be because I, for instance, expect that if somebody pulls out a weapon and I'm looking straight at the weapon, I'm assuming that people are running around behind them, uh, running around and fearing for their lives uh, because they're very scared of that situation. But yet I'm much more likely going to report that, but even though that may not necessarily even be the case. One person may have just walked away or one person may have hidden away, but this mentality or this idea that you have this concept that this is potentially what should have happened is what's going to actually then be uh, given as a recollection of the events which ultimately is going to leave us open to many, many errors, errors of commission or, or, or uh, that we're going to have here. And with these errors of commission are essentially where we're adding information in to complete the story uh, versus errors of omission where we're uh, taking information away from the story to leave gaps. But here you're filling in that information and we call those errors of commission. And, and we'll talk a lot more about that a little bit later on in terms of some of our lectures. 
Uh, and here, ultimately, what happened with the situation where we just demonstrated this weapon and you focus in on the weapon and everything else becomes blurry, just as the image suggests here, we have what's called weapons focus. That essentially we have this tunneling uh, vision that really focuses on the weapon and we find this very common uh, or very commonly uh, in situations where crimes have occurred with a weapon that people will report lots of details associated with the weapon itself, but not a lot of details about everything else, about what the person looked like, or about where they were, or about what was happening behind the scenes, but rather they'll report lots of details about the weapon itself, because that's where people are going to focus. And why? Well, because that's the deadly aspect, right? Uh, the person's shirt color is not going to kill you, but the gun itself will potentially kill you in this, uh, in this particular case. So when looking at this aspect uh, of of emotional memories, uh, we have to really think about the time that we spend on emotional events. Because one of the things that we do find is that we tend to spend lots of time on emotional events and thinking about those events over and over and over again, positive and negative. So even though we do have the Pollyanna principle that says that negative events will be recalled less than positive events, you still recall negative events anyways, and you tend to also think about negative events quite a bit and also positive events. But yet the amount of detail associated with a negative event might be less than with a positive event or in terms of their accuracies as well. So here we tend to revisit both positive and negative uh, emotional events quite frequently, and this should actually promote retention. But this is not always the case, that we actually find that there are situations where individuals don't necessarily recall lots of information associated with the emotional event, especially if they're negative, such as what the Pollyanna principle was, uh, was indicating to us. Now, if there's delays between the emotional event and the recall, is ultimately also going to lead to decreases in the recollection ability of that individual. So in other words, just as what uh, Ebbinghaus was predicting for us, the more time that it takes from when I learn the information to when I'm tested on the information, the less likely I'm going to be able to recall it 100%. Same thing is happening here. If an emotional event occurs to us, but then we think about it months, weeks, years down the line, it's going to be a lot harder for us to actually recall that information accurately. So here, the emotionality of the event is also going to decrease as time passes by because if it did not really make an impactful, uh, an impactful uh, meaning to you at that specific time, it's going to be very difficult for you to actually extract the, the emotionality associated with it and thus giving it the importance that you think it should deserve or does not deserve and thus not necessarily allowing itself to be um, molded to have more uh, vividness associated with the memory. And here again, remember this aspect of glucocorticoids, that with glucocorticoids, essentially we're going to have a reduction of the, the ability to process information with the hippocampus, so thus there's going to be a less likelihood that we're going to actually recall those events accurately later on. And with flashbulb memories, remember also that with flashbulb memories, we have these exceptionally clear, very detailed recollections of information that happen to us or even in a very public situation that there's a lot of emotionality that goes with it, thus demonstrating the importance of having a lot of emotion associated with those specific uh, events. Now, even with flashbulb memories, uh, one, of the, one of the cool aspects, if you want to think about it that way, uh, is that we have this photographic quality associated with a flashbulb memory. And unfortunately, though, that even though we do have this photographic quality, sometimes uh, that photograph that we end up taking or that photographic quality that we have uh, ends up having lots of gaps and holes, thus leading to errors of commission, again, filling in information because of schemas and scripts that ultimately indicate to us what should have potentially occurred. And we'll talk a lot more about this aspect of having these photographic qualities and errors of commission and omission uh, a little bit later on in the semester as well. Now, Alan Badley, who we've already uh, known a little bit about with Working Memory Model, also suggested that there's a lot of aspects associated uh, with learning information when emotional events occur. Uh, so, for instance, one of the things that he found back in the 70s was that during emergency situations, people had greater difficulty following instructions that they had actually learned. So, in other words, they had already learned the information in a regular situation, but now during the emergency, 
they're having difficulty retrieving that information. Why would that potentially occur? Well, because there are other priorities that are probably uh, occurring that you need to really be in charge of, such as saving your life, because again, what's more important than your life? Nothing in reality. So for you, you're gonna try everything in your nature to save your, your own life, and thus there's gonna be uh, this uh, forgetful aspect in terms of a failure to retrieve information that you learn that you're supposed to do to potentially save uh, a life. So that's why people end up following or doing the wrong action during emergency situations because they're having problems, they're having this interference that's occurring in retrieving the right information because other things are taking precedence at that time. Now we also find uh, that other researchers have, have indicated for us that we have, uh, during traumatic surgeries, worse recollection of events. Uh, and why that happens uh, for some surgeons, uh, this potentially happens because it's very, very stressful for them and as more stress occurs, <clears throat> it may potentially lead to higher activation of glucocorticoids, thus lower uh, activation of the hippocampus, but yet they're still able to do the job, but yet they recall less details. They just say it was very, very stressful, it was a very difficult surgery in that particular case. Now, if we look at the idea of, of the mood that you're in, right, because this is a big issue, uh, how is it that we actually act in terms of, uh, of memories occurring or specific events? Again, we look at the Pollyanna principle with positive and negative events. Uh, with positive events, if we're uh, perceiving them as being positive, we're generally going to recall them much more than negative events. This isn't always the case. We do find some situations where people recall very negative events, or if they were in a negative mood, they tend to recall events very uh, vividly or even uh, at better recall rates because those are some exceptions that do uh, happen uh, with memory research, that we don't always see this perfect one-to-one -one correlation that we assume that something positive occurs, thus we're going to have higher recall rates. That doesn't always happen uh, in real-life situations. Now, we also have mood congruence uh, that predicts for us that the mood that we're in at the encoding structure or at the encoding stage, so in other words, when you're learning information, if you have a positive mood and you're taking a test and you're also in a positive mood, you tend to have a higher recall rate. If you were in a negative mood at uh, learning and a negative mood at testing, you tend to also recall more information. And why does that happen? Because that mood functions as a cue. And we've talked already about this in previous lectures as well, that you could use different things from your environment with this idea of encoding specificity, that you're gonna be able to use different ideas or different objects from the room to remember specific information. Uh, so thus, for instance, when we talked about Rajan Mahadevan, that he would look at the face of that statue and he would wrap all those numbers around, he would use the face as a cue to be able to wrap around those numbers and recall them at later points in time. The same thing is happening here, but now we're just using something like our emotion to be able to dictate to us what kinds of things that we should be remembering in those specific instances. So we can ultimately end up having what we call mood dependence, where mood functions as a cue for us to be able to help us recall specific information uh, at specific times. And the amygdala seems to be a very important part of our brain that seems to dictate for us how we are going to be acting in specific situations. So we find that the amygdala seems to play a very, very vital part in terms of the aspect of emotionality and with recollection of information and also the storing of information at later points in time. Uh, and when we get a little bit later on in the semester to some of the biological aspects, we'll, we'll get a little bit more into that aspect as well. So now let's t turn our attention a little bit uh, to this aspect of the intensity of words because we look at words themselves and we think to ourselves, man, there's just some words that really do carry a lot more uh, emotionality than other words. So when looking at the emotionality of words, uh, one very famous researcher by the name of Elizabeth Loftus, and I'm oh, sorry, I went to the wrong slide, guys, sorry. Uh, Elizabeth Loftus and her colleague Palmer back in the 1970s uh, did some very interesting work associated with how it is that we select specific types of words and they may produce specific types of events or recollections of information. Now one of the things that Elizabeth uh, Loftus and her colleague did back in their research study was they asked participants to watch a video of a car crashing. And when a car crashed, uh, afterwards they were asked uh, to recall 
uh, the event that took place, but they used specific keywords. Now, the keywords that they used ultimately changed the way that they reacted to the information that they recalled in that specific event. So they used key phrases like the following, how fast were the cars going when they crashed? How fast were the cars going when they hit? So using that keyword, crashed versus hit, Incredibly, uh, Elizabeth Loftus and her colleague found very substantial differences in terms of the ways that people recall details of the events and also even aspects associated with the speed of which the cars were going when they collided with each other or they crashed or they hit. So here I just want to very quickly show you the results of her research and essentially this is what she found. So whenever it is that she used the keyword hit versus smashed versus collided versus bumped, versus contacted, she found very interesting results in terms of the way that they reported mean mile per hour uh, estimates. So when smashed, people reported 40.8 miles per hour, collided 39.3, bumped 38.1, hit 34.0, and contacted 31.8. So essentially what Elizabeth Loftus found was that when she used these different keywords, people had different experiences in terms of the way that they were recalling the same event. Even though everyone watched the exact same video, she identified that by using these different keywords, we were going to have different recollections occurring for the events. Now one of the interesting findings that she found was that when she used words like collided or smashed, people started even reporting that they started seeing other things that didn't even happen in the actual video itself. So when she had people uh, in the smashed group, she started having people reporting accidents like the following. That there was this terrible accident, there was blood, there were people hanging out of windows, they were like all this broken glass everywhere, when in reality none of that had happened. The video just showed these two, gar two cars coming in close contact with each other, bumping each other, but that's about it. There was no broken glass, there was no blood, there was no uh, broken headlights or anything like that. Nothing that looks like anything in this picture, but yet that's what they reported. Thus in indicating for us that whenever it is that we are processing information, it depends a lot with the way that we're actually asked to retrieve the information. So we put information in, that's great, into long-term memory. But when we are asked to get the information out, it seems that there are aspects of emotionality, even with keywords that we're asking you to use to retrieve that information, may even potentially have an effect. So let's now look at how we actually put the information into long-term memory, because this is a major issue for us. How do we actually encode information? Now, the idea behind encoding information is that whatever it is that we put into long-term memory is going to get stored in the right place with the right tags. That's really the idea behind it. But that's easier said than done, to be honest with you. Because one of the things that we find is that many instances we have the wrong tags or we put the file in the wrong location. And that happens to us all the time, right, when we're saving files into our flash drives. That we click Control S and you're like, where did I even save that document? I don't even know where it is. Or maybe you gave it the wrong name. So thus giving it the wrong name or putting it in the wrong location is going to have a detrimental effect to the, your ability to be able to retrieve that information. And again, it's not that you don't have the information, it's there. You just can't take it out because you don't know where you put that information. So successful remembering, so in other words, successful uh, extraction of information from long-term memory, identifying the right information is gonna depend on the encoding, on the storage, and on the retrieval. So in other words, how it is that we coded it, right? Giving it the appropriate tags, putting it in the right place, and then also making sure that we have the right cues to take that information out, being asked the right questions in the right format. So this is positively correlated with time information is held actually in working memory. So the more time that you actually spend working on the information, giving it more deeper elaborate processing versus shallow processing, it's going to help you be able to, number one, encode it correctly, so giving it the appropriate codes, number two, store it in the right place, and number three, get the right retrieval cue. So in other words, you're going to extract that information in only specific situations, not in every single situation. So it's going to decrease that there's going to be problems at long-term memory storage, okay? That's what we're trying to get to, that we're having decreases in errors. That's what we're trying to do. We're having increases in productivity because if I put information in, I want to be able to take that information out. It's going to depend a lot on how it is that I worked on that information.
So what are some techniques that we can use to encode information? Well, number one, we can use what's called the encoding specificity hypothesis, and we've already visited this idea in the past, and we'll just revisit it very quickly here. And with the encoding specificity hypothesis, remember that depending on the location of where it is that you're learning the information, it's going to have a higher probability that you'll recall the right information if you're in the same in the same location or in the same uh, given place where you learn that information. So again, using environmental cues is going to be very successful uh, a method to be able to retrieve that information later on because you're using those cues from that situation to be able to encode and apply those tags to that specific data that you're trying to learn. Rehearsing information is going to be ideal as well. So in other words, making sure that we process information over and over and over again, making sure that we use things like rote rehearsal, so just repeating information to yourself is going to be a very good method to be able to learn the content of what it is that you're trying to, to understand, but yet that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a deep level understanding. So you're going to be able to remember the words that you may have used or the picture itself, but maybe not understanding the meaning behind it, which may be a different process that you may have to take later on. We may want to use something like visual imagery, and we're going to talk a lot more about these techniques later on in the semester when we have a whole discussion about different memory techniques or how to improve your memory. But using visual imagery is going to be very, very important. Creating a visual image with whatever it is that you're trying to learn is going to be very important. Creating an interactive uh, situation. So for instance, uh, when you're learning uh, about uh, something like encoding, think about applying a tag at the supermarket on uh, the memory, right? That you're applying this tag and on that tag, it just doesn't say the price, but it also gives you information about um, where it was made, how much it cost, uh, what kind of fibers it's made out of, and so on and so forth. All the little details that come on the tag, it's on there so that, that way you know at least a lot of the information. And that's going to potentially be able to be a useful technique to create this visual representation of what it is that we're doing in that specific instance. Also using context learning, so using the context situation to be able to answer some of your questions. Uh, we do this a lot whenever it is that we read. If there, we encounter a word that we don't know, uh, we use the surrounding context of the sentence to be able to help us identify what that word is rather than having to go and look it up in a dictionary or something or on Google, right? Um, also, organizing material is going to be very, very important. Creating hierarchical uh, structures and using hierarchical searches is going to be very, very important. So using those hierarchical models uh, that we looked at, uh, at earlier on in the lecture are also going to be good techniques to be able to understand information. Using good structures to be able to organize yourself to be able to learn information is also going to be helpful. Now, when we encounter some potential problems as well, uh, we may have these problems that, that occur at encoding. So one of the issues that we may encounter at encoding is that if we are too stressed out during the situation, we're too aroused, and here when I say arousal, don't think physical arousal, but rather think emotionally aroused, so there's a lot of negativity or a lot of stress or a lot of anxiety that's surrounding the situation that I'm in, that may potentially hinder my ability to perform well. We also have the issue of source confusion uh, occurring where we may misattribute where an event actually occurred. So, or where the event occurred or who was in that specific situation or at what time it occurred or instances associated with specifics about a situation. And the reason that that may happen is that there may be situations that are very, very similar in nature and thus you may get those issues uh, mixed up. So here, for instance, oh yeah, I was talking to, to Becky about this, but in reality, I was talking to Susan about this. They look very similar and they're both very good friends, but I was telling one person versus the other. And here, this happens quite a lot, right? They're, they're, they, you tell your friend, yeah, I told you about this information. I told you that this had happened. And you're like, no, it was not me. But yet you had told somebody else. The repetition of information should hopefully um, help uh, decrease misattrib uh, misattributing uh, where that event was actually witnessed or who was there or at what time that actually happened. So by repeating it more and more and more may actually help reduce some of that. But it also may help uh, you know, reinforce that aspect of misattributing as well. If you keep thinking about the same situation as well and, and keep saying, yeah, it was with Becky, it was with Becky, it was with Becky, but in reality it was with Susan in that particular case. And we also have the issue of overshadowing, and, and 
I, I do apologize. That graphic should have come out a little bit earlier when we were talking about arousal, and I'll talk about that graphic in just a second here. Uh, but with overshadowing effects, one of the things that we have is this aspect of competition between codes. So remember when we talked about this with working memory, that if you're trying to learn two auditory uh, content or two auditory pieces of information at the same time, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to pay attention to both and work on both. So rather here, what should you do? You should try to only use one specific code and eliminate all the other the code so that, that way we don't have the overshadowing effect. So if you're trying to learn visual information, don't have verbal information coming in and overriding or potentially overshadowing what it is that you're trying to learn in that specific, uh, specific situation. Now, looking at this graphical representation here of this uh, curve of this normal distribution that we have of arousal, why is it that I have this uh, graphical representation here to demonstrate the issue of arousal with encoding? Uh, Yerkes and Dotson create this very famous uh, curve right here. Uh, and this is what we actually call the Yerkes and Dotson uh, curve. And, and Yerkes and Dotson propose the following situation to us. They propose that to be able to adequately learn information, we have to have some aspect of arousal or anxiety or stress related to a situation that you can't go into a situation and not have any arousal or any stress. Because if you have zero arousal or zero stress, you're much more likely than to perform inadequately or perform very, very low, as it's shown here. So you have low arousal, you're going to perform very low on the task. Why, you may ask yourself? Well, think of it like the following situation. Say that you have never attended class, and now all of a sudden you, you know that an exam is going to come up tomorrow. So now you have to study. But you really don't care. You're like, well, I've never gone to class. I really don't care. I really don't even like this class. Pfft, whatever. I'm not even going to really study. So you study a little bit, but you're really not stressed out about it because you know that you're probably not going to pass it anyways, or you just don't have any type of emotional valence associated with that situation. It's creating no anxiety or stress for you. So here, for that person, they're probably not going to even put a good effort into trying to actually learn that information. Yet at the other extreme end, we also have too much arousal, too much stress. According to Yerkes and Dotson, if we have too much stress or too much arousal, this is going to potentially hinder us from being able to adequately learn information. So in other words, I'm too stressed out to actually study, thus I'm not concentrating enough or paying attention to the material that I'm learning. So thus, I can't encode the information correctly because I'm too stressed out. So according to Yerkes and Dotson, what should you do? Yerkes and Dotson propose that you should have some type of medium or moderate arousal. So in other words, if you have anxiety, but yet you don't have too much or too little anxiety, you should perform at your optimal. Why? Because for you as an individual, now what you're going to start doing is you're going to start getting a little bit worried about the test because you care. But at the same time, you have enough confidence that you have all the material and all the strategies to be able to be successful. And if you view it in that fashion, having a good positive attitude, yet having a little bit of that stress, you're much more likely than to perform well. Uh, my father, when we were kids, uh, he would always ask us right before an exam, are you scared? And we would say yes or no. And if we ever said no, he would get worried and he would say, well, this is why you need to worry about it. And he would always tell us about the importance of studying and about the importance of being uh, good students and about the importance of having a good career and so on and so forth. So he would try to stress you out a little bit so that, that way you would gain a little bit of, of anxiety and want to actually perform well. But then if you said, yes, I'm way too stressed out, I can't even like study, I don't even know what to do, he would try to calm you down so that, that way you could really focus your attention and try to really think about what it is that you needed to, to study for the exam. And he would make you write down a list and everything like that. And my dad would always say, I never trust anyone who is not a little bit worried. And he was right, because if a person is completely not worried, they're not putting their best foot forward. And if a person is too worried, they cannot concentrate enough to do well either. So here, they have to have a little bit of moderate anxiety so that, that way they can perform their best. All right, so now we got information in, right? Or that's what we assume. Now we got to get the information out. This is the problem, right? That's not easy. It's definitely not an easy task. This is probably the hardest task. So it's already hard to get information in to your memory bank. Now it's very, very difficult to get information out. Now, one of the things that we may actually encounter uh, whenever it is that we're trying to retrieve information is that we may encounter what are called spacing effects. So again, the time between when you encoded the information to when you're being tested is going to 
affect greatly your performance. So if you studied again six weeks prior to the exam but then didn't study at all in between, well it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to perform well because you waited way, way too long to be able to study uh, or you studied way, way too early for the test. You need to space it out evenly so that that way you can study appropriately in a given amount of time to when the test is going to occur. But also don't wait to the very last minute to try to cram in all that information because it's not going to get in because it may be too much information you may be overloaded at that time. Again, focusing in on deep or shallow processing is going to be very, very important. Uh, focusing on the deep aspect, making those elaborate connections, understanding what the information is, giving yourself enough time to really uh, understand the information is going to be critical to your success. And then also, you generate your own study strategies. You generate your own examples because that really does help you study for the test. I always tell students, if you want to think about what I'm going to ask on the test, write your own questions. And why? Well, put yourself in my shoes as to what I would ask. Generate your own questions. And a lot of times, you guys do come up with the questions that I would actually ask on the test. Because those are very, very uh, easy questions to come up with because you put yourself in my situation. But don't take my strategy to study because my study strategy is going to be very different than something that's effective for you. So you have to generate it on your own. If I give, just give you the questions, for you, you may say, man, some of those questions don't even make sense. But if I ask you to come up with them, they're going to make sense in your own general way. So what are some general principles uh, that ultimately govern retrieval? Uh, well, number one, the retrieval cues that you're using. Using the appropriate retrieval cues is going to be fundamental to your success is to retrieve the right information. In other words, putting the right tags is going to be key to extracting the right information. That's going to be critical. Using the environment, encoding specificity, again, as an issue to being able to retrieve information. So the location where you studied to the location where you're going to take the test. That's going to be very, very important. Or having your lucky pen out, because the lucky pen is going to help you, not because it's lucky, but because every time that you have that lucky pen, you may look at that pen when you're studying. And having that pin during the exam may potentially also help you retrieve some of that information. Using top-down versus bottom-up processing. Think about the situation that you're in. What are some logical questions that would come from that situation? Think of the situation that you're placing yourself in as well is going to be very, very important. So when I'm in a situation like X, what have I done in the past? So using guided knowledge, the idea of top-down knowledge, schemas to be able to drive your performance. Don't just always rely on, well, they're going to give me all the little bit and bits and pieces of information to be able to retrieve the right information. Because that's not always the case. When you go and meet with somebody and they say, hi, how are you? You better use some of your own knowledge about the situation to be able to answer those specific questions. So for instance, if you're meeting the President of the United States and you're like, hey, and he says, hi, how are you? You're not going to say, well, you know me, it's been rough, studying for a lot, doing that kind of thing. Because for the President, that may not be a, an adequate conversation. So you have to think about that situation that you're going to be going in. And once a question is asked, you retrieve the right information. You say, it's going great, and this and that, and so on and so on so forth, right? You're going to use those types of situations in that specific instance. Think also of spreading activation uh, as being a, a major issue in terms of retrieval. When we activate one node, it's going to be then activating other nodes as well, and that's going to be very, very important for us. Also, interference is a major issue that concerns us whenever it is that we're trying to retrieve information, having the aspect of proactive interference versus retroactive interference. So the information that we've learned prior now getting in the way or the information that we now have learned getting in the way of the old information. So that's always a big issue for us whenever it is that we're trying to retrieve the correct pieces of the puzzle. And last, the retrieval practice. So how it is that you actually use the information. How did you practice that information, number one? And number two, what cues are you using to retrieve the information? Are they auditory versus visual cues? Uh, did you store it as an auditory uh, as an auditory memory or as a visual memory, what is it that you're doing in those specific situations? So using all of these different components are going to be critical to our success to extracting the right information. All right, so where does this leave us at? This leaves us at the end. What do we learn here throughout this entire process? Well, long-term memory is a complicated process. It's a very, very complicated beast. 
Why? Because there seems to be a lot of moving parts that can affect what it is that we put in and what we take out. So in conclusion, think about the importance of encoding, storage, and retrieval. How are we putting information in? Where are we putting the information? And also, how are we taking that information out? What's leading you to your success to take that information out is ideal for us. And ultimately here, hopefully you're able to retrieve the right information. And here I say right in quotes because I don't know if it's the right information. You're the one who stored that information. You could have saved the totally wrong file, but it's your job to pull out the right information. And you need to be able to use those right retrieval cues. You hopefully use those right tags whenever it is that you're storing information. And hopefully everything goes well whenever it is that we encounter a bear out in the woods. So that wraps up our conversation of long-term memory. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed this uh, week's lecture. Uh, please make sure to complete all the information and to complete all the tasks for this week that have been posted on Blackboard for you. And I hope that you have a good rest of your week.